We on? Well, the first thing I want y'all to do is take a look at my breakfast. <laughs> I'll be out here ginger shot. I have quinoa, kale, and avocado. I have kale, apple, ginger. And I have my coconut. Straight out the coconut. Very important. Okay. Well, I was eating. And I said to myself, I want to share some information. Because someone told me good food tastes bad and bad food tastes good. That was this conversation for the morning. And I said, that's an oxymoron. Because there's no way good food can taste bad and bad food tastes good. Because if it's bad, then that's how bad tastes. Quite simply. If that's bad food, then that's how bad food tastes. And if food is good, that's how good tastes. So the problem is your program. And we say, but how can you do this? How is it? How are you able to eat this type of food? <clears throat> and I say, quite often, it's the knowledge associated with the food. Not only do I know this is good for me, which should be the only reason I'm consuming it, but I know the harmful results of the other foods that I'm consuming. But bear with me. This is a spontaneous stream and I only did it on the strength that there's a lot of sick people, like literally sick, doing streams about health. People who are medically diagnosed as sick. People that have no legitimized information when it comes to these subject matters. But still, they speak on it and tell you that people like myself that's been doing the study for years don't know what I'm talking about. But these guys are meat eaters, and still they should be trusted with their with information, right? So let's go through it like this. One of the points of contention is where do we get the protein from? Well, understand this. When it comes to meat, meat has protein and plants have protein. Meat has insulin growth like factors. Insulin like growth factors. One. Okay? So IGF1. IGF1. Insulin like growth factor. Insulin like growth factor. That's very important. All right, this is what you're getting when you consume animal protein. And what the insulin-like growth factor does is amongst many of a number of atrocious things, the insulin-like growth factor causes the blood glucose level to decline. So what we're talking about is offsetting diabetes. And they tell you, you gotta, you gotta eat meat, particularly chicken. They tell you to make sure you eat chicken because it's high in protein. But they don't tell you that when you get the chicken, when you eat the chicken for protein, you're also getting what? Uric acid and ammonia. This is also gonna offset arthritis and a whole bunch of other <coughs> bone, uh, bone and joint disorders, all right? So one is the IGF-1. This is not things that's taught in school, so of course, if someone outside of the school system tells it to you, they tend to be of this complexion on top of it, you have the tendency to believe we don't know what we're talking about. All right. So, another thing is, when you're looking at plants, plant protein is more complete. The plant protein has the nine essential amino acids that we need. Animal protein doesn't have the nine essential amino acids that you need. 
it's incomplete. And not only is it incomplete, you're getting some of those amino acids in excess, in excess, and not only are you getting some of these amino acids in excess, what's happening is this. Animal protein is high in sulfur containing amino acids. So not only are you not getting the complete amount of amino acids, you're getting a compromised rendition of the same. So on one level, plants are giving you nine major amino acids. Animal protein is not giving you all of that. Secondly, the animal protein is high, okay, in what? Insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, which causes a declination in your glucose blood level. And this clearly offsets diabetes, all right? And so keep in mind, insulin, when you think of hormones, when you think of diabetes, diabetes is a hormonal disorder. So hormones give instructions. So diabetes is a hormonal disorder. It gives your body instructions on how to deal with blood sugar called glucose. It gives your body instructions, gives cells instructions that they need to open up their cells to allow the blood sugar to go in so it can metabolize properly. Without the insulin, your body's ability to metabolize is compromised or create change for the sake of energy. That's what we'll say right now. Well, again, we're going to go through protein and iron. That's what we're going to do. So for one, and I want you to look up this information so you can see what I'm saying. When you get too much of this IGF-1, this insulin-like growth factor, it offsets cancer, okay? <laughs> Amongst many of a number of things, it offsets cancer. Secondly, if we're gonna talk about protein in plants versus protein in animals, again, the protein in animals is not complete, as in the case of plants, they give you nine of the major amino acids. But who cares, if you never learned this information, yo, I'm just gonna eat protein. And the places they tell you to get the protein is the meat, and as an example, chicken being one of the most popular, they tell you, hey, eat the chicken for the protein, but they don't tell you in order to eat the chicken for the protein, you also have to take an ammonia, acid, and uric acid, obviously acid. Now, also you need to understand that animal protein is high in sulfur containing amino acids. So what your body has to do to buffer the acidity of the sulfur containing amino acids is to leach a process called leaching, where they leach, the body leaches calcium off of the bones to buffer the acidity from the sulfur containing amino acids. Because what happened is it'll make you more vulnerable and susceptible to various diseases. Because once your body becomes a playground for acid, it becomes a playground for parasites, microbes, bacteria, and viruses that's harmful to the body. So what your body has to do is pull calcium or leach calcium from the bones to buffer the acidity that's caused by the sulfur-containing amino acids that came from the animal protein. You get this animal protein from milk and obviously from meat. This is also going to promote diabetes. It's also going to offset diabetes. And then the excess calcium has to be stored in the kidneys. And then now you have these extra calcium deposits, which creates stones. And now you got kidney stones. All right. Also, because you're leaching calcium off of the bones, because you're leaching calcium off the bones, guess what happens? When you leach calcium off the bones, you're compromising bone density. So the next thing that happens is osteoporosis, particularly in women, because women on their cycle are losing calcium month to month. In addition to them consuming meat that's high in self-containing amino acids, so now this this loss of calcium is twofold. And this loss of calcium is twofold. And now, once she has osteoporosis, the next thing that goes is her hearing called bone conduction loss of hearing. It's called bone conduction loss of hearing. You can look this stuff up. But you can continue to eat your 
Or uh, get your source of proteins from animals if you choose. Next conversation. Iron in plants versus iron in animals. Let's do it like this. Iron in animals is called heme iron. They don't teach you that in school. It's called heme iron. All right? Mostly found in the muscles. So you got heme iron, and then you got the iron that's in plants, dark green leafy vegetables, called iron fluorine. This is very important, because one thing is your pineal gland is magnetized to fluoride. And so what happens is iron fluorine is normally covalently bonding. And so the fluoride brings the iron to the pineal gland. That iron hits the pineal gland and helps the pineal gland do its job. When you take in heme iron from animals, you don't get that composite of iron and fluoride. You wind up just getting fluoride, all right? And too much fluoride creates too much deposits in the pineal gland that creates phosphate crystals, and therefore it causes your pineal gland to be calcified. Now it's be hard for you to sleep. You'll be doing a lot of snoring, because when the pineal gland is calcified, the ability to produce melatonin that helps you rest keeps your skin clear, keeps you intuitive, it goes on decline because your pineal gland is calcified. The ability to lucidly dream, you're going to sleep having dreams and not even remembering what you're dreaming about. You're just waking up every day. And this is normal to the average person because insanity and sickness has been normalized. <laughs> These are facts. So what happens is, Iron fluorine from dark green leafy vegetables is the type of iron you want. You don't want, pardon me. People always calling me. Pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anything. It's part of the universe. Once we open ourselves up to information, we tend to be magnetized to person, places, and things that correspond with it. So it's real. But uh, yeah, you just go to I Am Brother Polite on YouTube, or you can go to Brother Polite on Instagram and DM me, and then I can give you all the different classes and everything I'll be having. Are you a doctor? No, I'm not. I just I was cured of diabetes from my teacher, Dr. Sebi, when I was 20, turning 21, and I never changed the way I ate since. Oh, and I don't even know me. No. None whatsoever. Well, I'm saying get the protein from the plants. But what about the, like, there are two types, type 1 and type 2, right? Yes. Well, that's the thing. That's how tricky this is. Like, when you go to the store, sometimes you see water that says has fluoride and flor uh, doesn't have fluoride. When you see those options, the consumer, who, unsuspecting as they are, they'll probably get the one that has fluoride because the other one doesn't. So a lot of times, it seems like if it does have something, we need to get it because they just told us it has it. So with the plants, when they say, oh, the plants doesn't have this, it makes you feel like, well, I need to get it from over there. But the problem is, the protein that's in the animals has the insulin-like growth factor. That's what it's called. And so when you take in animal protein, it's a company with a lot of clauses they don't tell you. So one, and you're supposed to get nine amino acids when you're attempting to consume protein. Plants have the nine amino acids, it's complete. When you take protein from animals, it doesn't have the nine amino acids. So it's incomplete. And then what it does have, when you take plant protein, when you take animal protein, is something called IGF-1, right? And insulin is instructions that's when insulin is. gives instructions right okay. so when you take igf1 it's giving your body instructions to get bigger than you're supposed to and then what happens is when you eat plants 
let's say you get a bunch of green, you get to a point where you like either want to throw up or you be like, man, this is enough. I just can't eat this much green. That's on purpose because the plants are telling you you've hit your sugar limit or you've hit your protein limit or you hit your iron limit. When you take iron from animals, heme, and you take protein from animals, their protein and iron doesn't let you know you've had enough. And so you can get too much of the insulin-like growth factor, or you can get too much of the heme iron that's in animals. And when you don't know you're taking too much of the iron, then it's an excess amount. And the excess amount tilts the scales and offsets stroke when you have too much uh, animal iron, iron in general. You had a stroke last year. <laughs> That is young. And so it's a lot of times, like I said, with plants, you can only eat but so much dark green vegetables before your body is like, you just get this feeling, oh, that's enough. You can eat a bunch of string beans and some kale, right? And there'll be a point where you can like, you leave the rest on the plate like I had enough. Because it's telling you, you got the optimal amount. Okay? That doesn't happen from animal proteins because our body isn't compatible with the idea. It's just incompatible with the idea. So you'll just eat and never stop. None of that. You don't want to deal with none of that. But it's a good transition. If you're coming out of meat and then you do the fish, and if you do eat fish, you do your best. Particularly as a woman, you don't want to do too much of the tuna or the salmon because those are fatty fish and it sets off fibroids because it's high in estrogen. And when there's too much estrogen, when the estrogen level is too high, it creates fibroids. So you. you <laughs> you have those too. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it's really the food we need. And then they give you medicine to treat you but not cure you because the cure is in just changing the diet for the most part. That's the number one thing we can do to create a, a better situation for the body to do what it does. But it's hard for the body to combat something that you're endorsing or promoting. You know, like if, if I run a channel and I, and I tell you, uh, we have to stop sexualizing women, but at the same rate, on the same channel, I'm constantly showing you naked women at the same time. It's a conflict of interest. So with the body, we, we want to be healthy and we'll eat medicine, but they won't tell us to change the foods that we ate to get us into the problem in the first place. <laughs> so, so it's a contradiction. It's like, okay, so this, this medicine is just gonna make the pain subside for a little bit of time, right? And then I'm gonna go back to the pain. But if I got rid of the, the crisis that created the event, then the body could be like, okay, we see clearly this person is giving me the opportunity to heal myself. Because it's not so much that the body doesn't have the ability to do what we want it to do for healing, it's we're in the way of it. Because we're constantly doing the thing that put us in that situation. And then we compound interest with the medicine. So that's, that's why it's always important when people do the debate over plant protein and animal protein or plant iron and animal iron. First thing is, when they have that debate, first thing you say is, what's, what's the name of the iron that we get from animals? And what's the name of the protein that we're getting from animals? And then, what's the name of the protein we're getting from plants? And what's the name of the protein we're getting from animals? If they don't have the answer to that, then they really don't know what they're talking about. Because the name tells us what's going wrong. If you say heme iron, and you say iron fluorine, iron fluorine is in dark green leafy vegetables and heme iron is in meat. That means, oh man, you must know something. And if you know those two words, then you know, I need to stop eating that, that I need to stop using animals as a source for protein and as a source for iron. Because one, I'll eat it in excess and never know. Uh, if you take animal protein, even from milk, right? Animal proteins in it. So if you take animal protein, then we know that the amino acids, because when protein is broken down, the digestive system turns it back into amino acids. The amino acids that make up the proteins that's in animals contain sulfur. And then that causes the body's pH or potential hydrogen to become acidic. And then what the body has to do to stop all this excess acidity is leach or take calcium off of your bones to balance out the pH. But now you're sacrificing your bone integrity because you're eating things that's causing the acidity in your body. And then now the body has to find out what's, where to dump all this extra calcium that it's using to buffer or polarize this experience of acid from the sulfur-contained amino acids. Now you see, if I take protein from a plant, 
I'm getting my nine amino acids and I don't have to worry about my body ripping calcium off of my bones. Yeah, and what happens, you can tell if you're calcium deficient just by looking at your fingernails because you'll have these circles right here. By the cuticles, you'll see crescent shapes. Uh, if it's like a little white at the cuticles, like you have your nail polish, right? But when you look at your, your nails, like your nail bag, if it's oval shaped and white over here, if it's a discoloration, that's your body telling you you're low on calcium. And most times when women are on their cycle, that'll be the time that they'll see those crescent shapes right by their fingernails. And that tells you that you need to get more calcium. Now the problem is, you might be getting a lot of calcium, but it might be your source of calcium that's causing you the problems. Because your source of calcium comes with compromise, which demands that you gotta keep taking more calcium. Because if you're getting calcium from food that's also acidic, then your body has to take the same calcium that it took in, plus calcium from your bones, to buffer it, to try to get rid of it. And then also, like when we take milk, we say, oh, milk is high in calcium, right? But the ratio of calcium has to be one to one with magnesium. Yes. That's done that way so you don't have to be subject to too much acidity, right? Because calcium by itself is just not good for the bones. Calcium has to be accompanied by magnesium, right? And Vitamin D. And we know vitamins are produced from what? Sun exposure. If it's in a pill, it's not alive. And it, and it doesn't biologically, it doesn't come from a source that biologically embeds just like light does. Like this light is nutrition. But most of us, we have the type of lifestyle that demands we're at work when the light is out and we'll also work when the light is gone. And so we have to get supplements to supplant the lack of light activity. So when we get vitamins, we look at the word vita or vitality, right? And then you look at the word amen, which is the sun god in Egypt. Amen was the sun god. So they call him amen Ra. So we see vitality from sun. So we get our sustenance or our vitality from the sun. So whenever the sun comes in contact with our skin, it produces vitamins naturally. Well, you're not too far away from those people who uh, eat the sunlight. <laughs> you know, I don't give anything. Consume the sunlight. That's a fact. You're like borderline there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, that's, that's, you know, when people talk about uh, what they should eat or what they should have in their diet, firstly, I always say sun. Yes, air. Air, that's right. Water. So, what type of water are we drinking, right? Is it alkaline? And not only alkaline, was it turned into alkaline water or was it naturally alkaline? So, it's important to read. All right, what's that bottle of water you be drinking? Is, is it not? That's, that's one of them. It looks like a, um, they don't even, the label's like on the inside of the bottle, actually. Oh, naive. Okay. It's an 8.0 alkaline water. But what you want to do is, you want to look and see if the, the water was made alkaline in a factory. Or if, because what they'll do is infuse it with electrolytes and add minerals to it and then it loses its natural composition because now it's manufactured alkaline water, right? And just because the water's alkaline doesn't necessarily mean it's good because it might still be high in metals. So you wanna know if the water's, if you wanna know if the water's filtered and if it's naturally alkaline. So, um, yeah, one of those waters in there is, uh, this, they got like three of them in there. Yes, you wanna look for that. You wanna look and see, did they turn this water alkaline? <laughs> or was it naturally al alkaline through nature, right? Because we're talking about negative hydrogen eons, right? And in, in a biology world, negativity is positive and positivity is negative. So you actually want your water to be filled with negative hydrogen eons. And that's why it's good to shake it before you drink it because anytime you shake any liquid, it actually creates some form of alkalinity. You know, negative hydrogen eons cling to the corners of the bottle whenever you shake it. So, you want to have naturally alkaline water and hopefully it's filtered from metals or it comes from a source that doesn't have harmful metals in it. Like I said, not just good enough to have alkaline water, you want to have alkaline water that doesn't have harmful metals in it. So some people be like, hey, this is 8.5, but it could be 8.5 well, uh, with some mercury in there and some arsenic, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And normally if you taste like a metal, metal type 
flavor from the water, then you know there's uh, harmful metals in there. So you actually can kind of, you actually become more sensitive to it if you don't drink too many different flavors. Because what happens every every uh, 10 to 14 days, your taste buds change. They grow and they change. <clears throat> yeah, they die and they grow, they die and they grow. And every five years, you completely get a new set. Every five to seven years. Your taste buds, oh yeah, it happens to a lot of the body. But every five to seven years, your taste bud taste uh, changes down to the line and into your digestive tract and that's for a reason so what happens is and then when you get to a certain age it starts to die and then that's when you start wanting extra salt and extra sugar because you lost your sensitivity to it so what's important is let's say we say man I want to change my diet you if you st stood fast for uh, 10 to 14 days of eating the same new food you would have an acquired taste for it and then the previous food won't taste that good. But most people don't do 10 to 14 days. Because in 10 to 14 days, you'll get, so really what you want to do, you want to go, let's say, you may not know when you're on your last cycle of the 10 to 14 days. So what you want to do is about 21 days, <laughs> eating something new. And that's why most people say 21 day fast and everything like that without knowing. In 21 days, you would have, transition from the last 10 to 14 days somewhere in between and you will be on your new taste buds and then you'll be acclimating yourself to the new taste and this is why when people say like bad food tastes good and good food tastes bad that's just because of programming because if the food is good that's how good tastes yes and the reason why because i reprogram myself i know good food that's how good tastes so if i do yeah, watch this. That's what I'm saying. It's a program. <laughs> if I know this is good for me, right? And I know all the reasons why this is good, then this is how good tastes. And then if I know something's bad for me and I eat it, that's how bad tastes. So now if I understand that program and I and I line it up with my 10 to 14 days my taste buds change, that understanding, in addition to eating the same thing for 10 to 14 days or 10 to 21, by that time, you'll realize that your brain will be in conformity with your taste. Because what's going on is our taste is dictating to us what we're thinking. And that's actually an illusion. Because now we done, we done, this is almost a form of Satanism where, oh, good is bad and bad is good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that, that's, that's what they tricked us into thinking so we can embrace disease. And that's why I say that suicide is delicious because it's the, the highest death toll for any race is what they eat, not what someone else does. So. We'll die before what we eat before we'll die from a car crash, police brutality, or any other form of violence. We die from cancer, mostly. We die from AIDS. We die from anemia. We die from things, from circumstances that are precipitated by what we eat on a day-to-day -day basis. Because when asked to stop eating something, It'd be the, the jerk sauce or the curry sauce or the Thai flavor that I have. I like my sticky rice. I don't know if I can get rid of that. And it'll be that that'll lead us to our grip. It'll be the the fried chicken and the oil. You know what I'm saying? Do I eat what? Yeah, but not a lot. Very little. Because we don't eat carbs. That That's also a lot. It's, it's acidic. It's, Okay. Well, this is the thing. The problem is, a lot of people that become vegetarians or vegans, they may not be educated on the diversity of things that they can consume and the balance that needs to be created. So a lot of them, their teeth may be falling out, you know? And that's because people think so long as they don't eat meat, everything else is good. But no, that's not true. Carrots are not good for us. Broccoli is not good. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just, so, so, so watch this. The, the, the second we start eating good, right? Eat, there are such a thing as vegetables that's not good for you too. We just think, oh, so this is a vegetable. It's good, but tell yourself. You look at plants, right? Plants grow towards the sun. If you ever have a plant in your house, it'll be right by the window like this when the sun come out, right? And when the sun go down, you can see it like this, right? Does a carrot grow upward or grow downward? What kind of plant is that? 
it, what kind of plant grows downward as opposed to upward? The sun is up here. Yes, it's going down. That plant is going down. So if it's growing down in the earth, the only thing good about that carrot is the little green part that's on top. Well, isn't it good for your eyes? What color is that carrot? No, it's not. It's, it's horrible for your eyes. Just like they got the, the bunny eating a carrot. When have we ever, in real life, have you ever seen a bunny eat a carrot? Or lay an egg? <laughs> See what I'm saying? This is the games that they play. So when we see... <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm coming with that. <laughs> like, for instance, you know, people want calories when they go on uh, uh, the diets and everything like that. The coconut has 13 to 1400 calories just in the skin alone, each coconut. So this is your source of energy? One of my main sources of energy. Because you ain't going to really find much that's going to give you, uh, without eating a whole bunch of food, and it being water soluble and easy to digest on every level, this is going to give me about 1400 calories when I eat the skin. When I drink the water, this is my, my Gatorade. This is all, my five major electrolytes up in here. I'm gonna get my potassium, I'm gonna get my calcium, I'm gonna get my zinc, you know? So I can drink this water and eat this skin and be damn near fulfilled for the day. Wow. That's the power in the coconut water. And then I just be having this, my kale apple ginger for my source of iron, my malic acid from the apple for my skin. Malic acid comes from the apples, you know what I'm saying? So these are just formulas. My omega-3 grows my, helps grow my brain, especially if I eat avocado in the, in the morning. If you eat it in the morning, it helps build brain cells, right? Uh, it's a superconductor as well, or uh, maintains the superconductivity of the brain because the human body is electric. And then I get the fatty acids that's important. And the fat that I get from the avocado is safe because the avocado is accompanied with fiber. So the fat that I don't need, the fiber gets rid of. The fat that I do need, I take it in. So the, the avocado is filled with all these beautiful fats, and any fat I get in excess, in excess, the fiber in the avocado is going to diminish it or get rid of it. Now I take this, my ginger shot, right? Because ginger diminishes appetite. So if you don't want to be eating a whole bunch, or if you're nauseous, if you're nauseous, ginger get rid of that. If you like, like you get car sickness or whatever, I guarantee anytime you feel like throwing up. Boom, like when people begin all those weird drinks, because some people that drink liquor and everything, yeah. and they're like, oh man, I'm trying to avoid a hangover. I'm like, why don't you just have a ginger shot? Instead of those weird drinks that they give you, and you gotta take all those poisons. The ginger shot is gonna get rid of your hangover, or it's gonna make sure you don't have one, I should say. If they drink a little, but nobody wants to do something healthy in the middle of something so toxic, I understand. But if they were gonna drink, I don't care if it's a little bit of drinking. Drink one before, drink one after, and you won't have no hangovers. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? And you don't have to worry about being dizzy or going crazy. Or waking up with your stomach hurting or your head hurting and just kind of slow and drowsy throughout the day. Ginger does it. So ginger uh, promotes blood circulation, gets rid of your nausea, right? Uh, it, it definitely gets rid of your nausea. And it diminishes appetite. If you Like if you were to hit two of these back to back, and you just drink some coconut water, your appetite would diminish. So that's why my breakfast would just be kale and avocado and kinoa. How long have you been eating this? Uh, for as long as my daughter's been alive, so she's turning 13, so I'm turning 13 as a vegan. Yeah, so uh, it is a beautiful Any health thing. Huh? Any health issues? Nah, I haven't had a health issue. The only health issue I've ever had is when I, I travel a lot, I'm in and out the country a lot. Yeah. So sometimes being subject to different environments, sometimes I get a cough. Like I went to um, Cape, Co Cape Coast, and that's where like they started the transatlantic slave trade. So I went into the space where uh, the bodies were kept there, and so much decomposition of the bodies and fecal excrement was built up that I thought we were standing on the floor, and we was actually standing on the back. The floor was like a few inches down. So I breathed all that in without having a mask. So when I'm doing research, I go to these real dusty places of third world countries and places like that, I might uh, be subject to a respiratory issue, but it'll, it'll subside. But you don't have any No, not at all. So the only one that I could think of is when I'm traveling, because sometimes when you go into atmospheres that contrast immensely to the previous one, you go through a, a change. And then after my body gets acclimated, because when I go over, I stay for two, three weeks, then I get comfortable there, then I gotta come back here. 
then I gotta get adjusted to it again. And then I'm flying back out. Like, um, I went to Japan for New Year's. I stayed out there. I had business out in Japan. Prior to that, I was in Dubai. Prior to that, I was in Jamaica. Prior to that, I was in Cayman Island. So the only thing that I would be subject to is just a change in atmosphere and weather. And then I stay there long enough to adapt, and by that time, I'm already leaving. So that's the only thing. Yeah. Like you do not like the vitamins like other vegetarians or vegan. You gotta get it from the sun. Okay, sun. And, and listen to this. Vi vitamins are a lot, but you get these alphanumerics and you get confused by it. So, so B12 is a vitamin, right? See? You hear the letter B and you hear the number 12, you don't connect with something that's a lot. B12 is an organism that's birthed in the small intestine when you get sun exposure. But it's called cobalamin. They go to word I'm in again, right? So it's called cobalamin. That's what B12 is. It's an organism that's birthed in the small intestine. Consider trace mineral because you only really get it from the sun. So if you knew it was an organism, then you have to look at that pill like a suspect because you gotta say, what's the pill if this is an organism? Because you know the pill ain't a lot. So how can this pill at best fabricate the existence of a living entity whose job is to detoxify the melanin throughout the inside of your body. Because you know, your, your, your kidneys need a certain amount of melanin, your stomach needs a certain amount of melanin, your liver needs a certain amount of melanin, all your organs need a certain amount of melanin to be activated. So what's happening is your brain is on B12 seeing numbers and letters and there's a disconnect with knowing that vitamins are organisms that's created for the better good of you when subject to sunlight during different times of hours out the day. It's called the circadian rhythm. So at different hours, when subject to the sun, different vitamins are produced. Different hours. And by the time the day is out, you get the full spectrum. That's why a big part of diet should be, okay, well, you know what? On Mondays, I'm gonna get sun from 9 a.m. to 10. On Tuesdays, I'm gonna get it from 10 to 12. On Wednesdays, I'm going to get it from 12 to 3. Making sure we get the full sun spectrum so, at least throughout the week. Is that why Seattle has the highest suicidal rate? Yes. Because, because when you're vitamin deficient, pardon me, when you when you vitamin D deficient, it offsets pain, offsets stress, depression, anxiety, and in acute forms, suicide. So we know 90% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. And then you go to Seattle, they get the least amount of sun. So you see the most amount of suicide and uh anxiety related disorders. Yeah, take it down. <laughs> nah, not a problem. Where you from? Russia. Oh, for real? Yeah. Wow. You know, I went to Russia. Uh, when I went to Russia? I went to Russia on January. I, it was it was one one of the early weeks of January when I came from Japan. It was cold there at that time. Extremely cold. <laughs> it was freezing. Where? Did you go to Moscow? Yeah, I went to Moscow. I only stayed for two or three days, and then I, I came back to America. And it was, a, it was a connecting flight, and I purposely missed the connection mm -hmm. to just say I went to Russia and fill it out, because I just like traveling. Yeah. So because I had to connect to Russia back from, I think it was Dubai, I just missed the flight on purpose and stayed out there. Moscow. They love hamburgers out there. What? Burgers. Hamburgers. They do? Bunch of hamburgers everywhere I was going. That's, That's American. Yeah, it was a Burger King it all over like the Yeah, it was a bunch of Burger Kings. People didn't even know how to pronounce burger. Oh wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> when I went there, the, the second I got off the plane. I'm just sorry. The second I got off the plane, it was Burger King in Russia. No way. Yeah. And in the airport, Burger King. And then there was another burger spot next to Burger King. I was like, damn. And I was surprised that I even seen like that kind of American franchise. Thing. That's definitely there. Yeah, it's definitely there the second you land. Oh, it didn't used to be like that when I left. And I left like 17 years ago. So a lot of things. Were yeah, I imagine. So you live out here now? Yeah. Everything that you were saying kind of like I could uh, go inside. Yes. Yeah. And it's no, it's no coincidence because when I first. When I first started learning the information, I kept bumping into people, turning stuff on my 
seeing videos just kept it kept coming at me and I'm like well you know what I might as well just embrace it because it, I wasn't looking for it. it just kept coming kept coming and I'm like all right I gotta start studying I see what the universe is telling me something I'm being hard-headed because I was trying to ignore it because I still wanted to eat my chicken and everything but it just kept coming in front of me so I had to deal with it Sometimes we can eat and get the nutrients, but then the body has a problem of processing the nutrients. So no matter how much of the nutrients we actually take, the body's only taking a little bit of it. You know, and, and that's why it's important. Because when we when we take in animal and plant protein, that happens to a lot of people as they get older. Their body doesn't know how to interpret it because your body is saying, I'm used to you taking things you don't need and making us have to live off of it. So your body starts saying, well, you know, we're gonna start taking less of this give you signs and hope you change we and we normally don't change after we get the signs because we just start to believe that these things is just part of life yeah you know but it's not part of life you know what i'm saying you it? I, I didn't save it but it should be right there yeah. tell me if you see it you see it Rather yeah yeah so just text me and then i'll forward you to the information and everything Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. How long have you been doing it? 13 years? 13 years. Yeah, 13 years on the, the health tip. But yeah. teaching, probably was teaching. At, I was teaching a little before then, but not about health. I had to actually get into diabetes to actually start wanting. First, I had to go through my process, get healed, and then I was encouraged by the person that helped, that healed me to start teaching. And then I started teaching it later on. Yeah, but first, I was just finding my way. I wasn't teaching I'm another. Still yeah, well, I mean, like, I'm gonna try it's a process, but you'll feel different and you'll be thinking different, and then you just feel blessed. Like it, you know. Sometimes you know what people say. People be like, "My grandfather ate pig and all this, and he lived to be 98. This person eat vegetables and they died at 70 something. Great. So uh, now people, I be telling them, it's just like money, right? People, cause people like, yo, you gonna die anyway, so why you just can't eat what you want? I like it into money because I say you're gonna you're gonna um, spend money anyway, so why save it? So what I'm talking about is not quantity. I'm talking about quality. So when someone tells me about somebody that eats bad and they live to be 90 years old, I'm talking about the quality of life. I'm not talking about the quantity. That that could be determined by any of a number of variables. That could be you could already have a, a genetic predisposition towards a certain type of life that's stimulated by environmental circumstances, food, and what have you. So it's, it's not about the amount of years. And we don't know that to be a fact. If you're eating meat versus uh, plants, uh, the, the meat is making you live that long. Yeah, you would like to believe that because you want to keep eating meat. But what I can say is, if a box is getting ready to fight, they get a certain regimen so they can perform at an optimal level. I don't know what spirituality means to other people. Spirituality means a lot to me, being clear of one, being able to meditate and sit still for a long period of time, being comfortable to be in a position, be able to breathe. So for me, as a spiritualist, this is the most conducive form of food. I'm also a teacher and I have to rely on my memory. This is the most conducive form of food. So just like the boxer has... So you don't have memory problems? Nah, nah. So, hey, peace game. So just like, thanks for listening. So just like the boxer eats a certain type of way so he can perform a certain way, as human beings, we should eat a certain way so we could perform a certain way. I don't. I used to be a gang member. I was locked up for murder. When I started eating all these vegetables and kale juice, and I can't even find a violent bone in my body. Like I'm not even. It's hard for me to get angry. That's the kind of person I want to be. Because eating that way is a violent process. So if it's violent to break down the food, chances are you're violent in your emotions or your approach towards the world. So for me, it's the type of person that this eating has transformed me into. You know, it's not just, oh, I wanna I wanna live long. Now nah, that's good. You wanna live long, I still think you should eat this way. But I'm talking about my performance as a human being. My performance as a human being as far as memory is concerned, as far as spirituality, intuition, clairvoyance, psychometry, as, as far as being loving and more connected, being sensitive, 
uh, having more empathy. Eating like this produces more empathy hormones. Empathy hormones is like, if you watch a movie and you see somebody get hurt, you go, oh man, like you kind of feel it just watching it, right? So when we have more empathy for other people, you feel their pain just considering what they might go through. More empathy hormones are created when we eat like this versus when we eat meat, which means you become sensitive to how other people respond to adversity. In other words, you wouldn't want to do to them a certain way that you wouldn't want done to yourself. And you can actually feel their affliction to an extent just considering what they might have to go through. And it makes you more caring and embracing of empowering them and you'll, you'll, you'll put your emotions about yourself and let that subside. That's what empathy hormones do. So we're talking about the quality of a person, not the quantity of a person. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, not, it's not just that. So I'm, I'm like, yeah, this person can eat meat and do all of that, but at the end of the day, can he still be athletic at a certain age? You know, don't you want to still be able to move around and be there for your, for your children or for your grandchildren or your nieces, or you want to, you want, you want them coming to your bed, like, like I, I would pick, I would rather die at 75 in good health than to die with my life being prolonged into 99 with back pains and surgeries. Changed my gallbladder. They took my gallbladder out. I needed a new hip. I don't want to be living like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, so even in the hospital, they don't prolong life. They be prolonging death. They be like, look, we're going to keep you alive. We're going to keep you alive, but you're just not going to have fun. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can think, don't think about skiing. Cut. Cut. And that's what my teacher taught me, Dr. Sabi. He said, if the human body was meant to be open, you would have been born with a zipper. <laughs> he said, if the human body was meant to be open, God would have put a zipper on you so you could, he could, they could go inside of you. Okay. <laughs> Real talk. All right. So, All right. Uh, thank you so much. Hey, Hello, PC. Calling. What's your name, sis? Lana. 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 It's great talking to you. Polite. Polite. Okay. Yeah. And your name? I'm Annette. I'm Annette? Yeah, Lana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you so much. No problem. Peace to the family. Well, that was dope. That was dope. Let me see. You're on 4%, so please. I got you. I'm going to close out right here. Oh, this. Man. So, I mean, I covered the subject matter for the most part. And you know what, y'all caught a good live experience. Make sure you share the video because there's a lot of misconceptions and discrepancies about animal protein versus plant protein and animal iron versus plant iron. Make sure you do that. I'm gonna finish this breakfast of mine. Let me let y'all see this. Ginger shot, boom. Made fresh every day. <laughs> Those of you that take ginger shots, you're normal folks. <laughs> because when you first start, you be talking like this after. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to drink this coconut, then eat the coconut meat. Finish up my kale, quinoa, quinoa for the protein as well. And we good. I want to thank y'all so much for listening and tuning in. Email. You can hit me at brotherpolite45 at gmail.com if you're interested in consulting, especially in health. It's $200 an hour. $300 in person. You know, I do it with financing. Of course, we got the cryptocurrency course, insurance and credit. Always want your full name and your number. Full name and your number and what's the subject about. So you go to brother, P-O-L-I-G-H-T 45 at gmail.com. That ginger, man, is doing his work. Brother, P-O-L-I-G-H-T 45 at gmail.com. I apologize for telling you what happened. Put in the mouth. We're streaming live from the actual phone, and the phone's about to die. So, <laughs> and I gotta get ready to train with my daughter to play basketball. She's probably up ready to play ball now. So, we gotta travel and get ready to go to the park. <laughs>